Okay. Now, welcome to the consensus talks. Um, now you're asking, what's it all about? Uh, I don't know either. Uh, it's something like an, uh, an open space. Uh, you need to be prepared to be surprised because uh, we do uh, uh, seven sessions in 90 minutes. And uh, these are all sessions that were uh, uh, proposed to be on the part of the program. But unfortunately, uh, they didn't make it to the program, but the official program. But um, we've invited uh, those speakers uh, to uh, uh, come to, uh, to do their session in just 10 minutes. So uh, very condensed and short. So uh, and, and to keep uh, the, the, the thing a bit going, uh, we have a clock and they have exactly 10 minutes. And uh, we've tested the clock and it doesn't sound very loud. So either you should be very quiet. No, just kidding. Um, but uh, I'll, uh, I have uh, installed a kitchen timer on my uh, um, uh, s smartphone. Uh, that will probably be a little bit louder. But we'll c cut you down, uh, get you on uh, in 10 minutes. And then we have another one. Um, th they are in the booklet, uh, the, 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 the slides, the, the official uh, presentation as they send in. This is the condensed version. And uh, number seven uh, couldn't make it today. So we have one to six and then number eight. And we have uh, eight, seven sessions in 90 minutes. And I will start uh, by uh, setting the clock. I hope it's working. Okay, thank you. My name is uh, Gertje van der Ham. Um, well, my original presentation was about an hour, so I had to uh, get rid of all the waste. Um, but if I managed to talk you well in sleep uh, in the next 10 minutes, then uh, it was really bad. Um, I'm going to cover two items. Uh, why do we want to be agile? And what does this mean for the people, for the agile testers? Now, why do we want to be agile? That one of the questions I ask myself, that um, if, I think it's, it's a mindset, uh, that you really have to change your mind. If you don't do that, then you might end up with um, doing the things that you always did, but just in a different way. And what does it mean for the people? Is it just training, or is there more required to be agile? Um, now, this is my dog. Uh, he's called Mac. Mac is a border collie. And um, I was giving a presentation uh, not so long ago uh, for uh, my dog training school. They asked me to tell something about uh, how to, to get your dog under control again. And um, well, the first thing I saw there was this agile pr uh, testing presentation. So I made a mistake there. And I thought, well, um, let's try if I can uh, make this into a dog training. Well, it was not really successful. But when I was on the field training my dog, I realized that training a dog, it's, it's like an agile way of, of working. Now, Mac is a, a border collie, and they are um, known for their skills uh, by sh for sheep herding. And that's one of the things I do, sheep herding with, uh, with this dog. And when I started, uh, I explained what a sheep was, and uh, how, we, uh, the, how, how we should lay down, how to sit down, things like that, so the basic skills. Um, then we were getting more advanced, and then one of the things is that he has to bring the sheep to me. So when I sent him away, uh, the first time he ran right after the sheep, and the sheep were spread all over the field. So that was not, not the thing he had to do. But he was learning. And uh, the second time I sent him away, he was like a, making a little bow when he was getting behind the sheep. And he realized that if, if he was making a, a, a bigger turn and he was getting behind the sheep, that the sheep would stay together, and it was easier for him to bring him to me. So what, what, he, what he learned was um, how the sheep react, uh, what the sheep will do, and that, that he has to anticipate on the movement of those sheep. Now, a couple of weeks later, uh, he was behind those sheep, and I asked him to lay down, but he was not doing that. He kept them moving. But I couldn't see that one of the sheep was trying to get away. So again, he was learning, and he was not always listening to, uh, to my commands. So what, what Mac is, is really a good agile tester. He's looking at the situation, trying to adapt. And, uh, well, I would like to have him in my team. Um, now, one of the, the other things I would like to share in the next 10 minutes, just have a look at my, my uh, note over here. This, I noticed uh, when I was doing an, uh, a traditional project, a waterfall project, um, we had to implement a, a small item. It was uh, an input field uh, somewhere on the screen. And, well, it took us almost four years just for the implementation of a simple input field. And we were not adapting. We were not adapting to the requirements. And that was one of the moments I realized that if we had done this in an agile way, 
Well, I'm not going to say that we would have done it in, a, in one sprint, but we could have reduced the time to at least, I think, two years. Um, now, one of the other things... Now I switch it off, I think. There we go again. That is, is it, is it only uh, skills that you need? Well, th this, this is not a border collie, and I think that, that sh this sheep is thinking it's a cat that can bark. Um, it, I think there was more required. It's, it's called talent. And this dog has no talent uh, to, to do sheep herding. Now, just a question uh, for the people in the room over here. Is there anyone who plays football? Okay. Um, over there. Um, and are you a professional player or are you an amateur? Okay. <laughs> so you're an amateur. Now, <laughs> and, and do you support a professional team? And with Ajax, Amsterdam, okay. Now, um, and how often, how often do you train during a week? Once a week, okay. And the players from Ajax, how, how often do they train? Five, six times, and then most often they train twice a, twice a day, I think. So if you would do seven times a week, twice a day training, would you be a professional player? No. <laughs> No, that, 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 but that's what we do when we try to train the people. Then we think if we put a training, uh, uh, or if, if we just choose an, a different training, that we will um, train talent. But you can't do that. Uh, you would be a professional trainer for Ajax if, you, if that was the only thing it, it, it requires. Um, so when I'm sitting together my team, then I look what talent do, uh, do people have. That, um, um, for example, in, in a football team, you have... Um, you have someone who, can, who scores the goal, the attacker. You have a goalkeeper. You have the midfielders. Now, a professional football team, they, they don't train the goalkeeper to score the goals. Do they? And they don't train uh, the, the attacker to, to stop the goals. So you look at the talent uh, that people have, and based on the talent, um, that, that's what you're going to use. And I think that's what we should do in Agile as well. That if I set together my teams, I look at the talent that they have, and that's where, where, we, uh, where we train on. Now, I remember that uh, uh, one of my first Agile projects, uh, there was one tester, and um, he was a traditional uh, waterfall tester, and he would not test if there was nothing on paper, no requirements. And um, he wanted to sit together with the team and writing specifications, and only then he would start testing. Now, th th there was a comfort zone. So when I told them that we were going to do Agile in a uh, Scrum methodology, and that I wanted to sit together with the developers and uh, work together, well, there was quite a lot of confusion with this guy. He was not able to do that, or he didn't want to do that, because it took him out of his comfort zone. But he was a really good tester, so I wanted him to be part of the team. Now, in the end, then, when, when he used his skills, and he was very good in communication, he ended up to be one of the best testers in those teams. So I really think that you have to look at what are people good at, and um, use them that way. Now, a while ago, I was speaking to a colleague of mine, he's, he's from Belgium, and he said, well, where we were doing the planning, that only if you take in consideration the, the, uh, the possibility of a pess pessimistic scenario, then you only can be truly op optimistic. If you don't take in consideration any possibility of a risk, you're not an optimist, but you're a dreamer. So that's the, the last slide, that don't be a dreamer, be agile. Thank you for your attention. And we even have some time for, uh, for questions, if you have any. Um, I would like, if, if you're on the, on the event tonight, I would like to talk to you and have a beer with you and talk about dog training, if possible. <laughs> okay. Some more questions? No? Then uh, thank you, Gertjan. Okay.
Okay, that's fine. Cool. All right. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Uh, hi. Uh, I'm Shrinivas. Uh, so, Okay, that's fine. Let's let's go with what we have. Uh, so, so hi, uh, I'm, I'm Srinivas, and I work for a company called ThoughtWorks uh, in London. And um, over the years of my experience as a QA, uh, what I've seen is my perspective of what a QA is and the role of a QA has has been changing continuously and evolving. Um, so, in, in, I've like in the last one year, I got onto the bandwagon of uh, continuous delivery and saw that my, my perspective of QA has changed again. Uh, so I'd like to talk about what my new perspective is uh, as part of this uh, presentation. Uh, I've been to um, a couple of um, continuous delivery conferences and seminars um, uh, in various places, and then what I've seen or what I've noticed is that uh, those conferences have been just talking about DevOps in terms of uh, builds and build pipelines and uh, you know deployment scripts and stuff, uh, but I don't. I've not seen enough focus uh, being given to quality analysis or testing uh, in terms of continuous delivery. And uh, from what I've experienced in the past one year of being on a continuous delivery project, is that even on a QA, there's a lot of demand, uh, more demand uh, in 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 the situation of continuous delivery uh, compared to. Uh, a traditional agile uh, project. So just to give you a very quick background on uh, what, uh, what we are doing, uh, so I'll just give an example of the project that I'm working on. Uh, it, is, uh, it is for a client uh, who's, who's is developing, developing a web-based application. And uh, we are like five companies working together for the client. And we have several different uh, external integration uh, systems or points uh, to the application. Uh, apart from our various uh, uh, internal systems that are getting integrated, um, we have we have about like 40 people in the in the team uh, across various um, you know, sub projects. Uh, we are working as a program uh, overall, and uh, we are releasing to production every five days. Uh, so these are like some of the um, initial challenges that we have faced. So when we started off uh, about one and a half years back, uh, this project, uh, these are these were these, the challenges as a QA uh, that we were facing, um, and one of the biggest challenges was the the release process was uh, too long, and the QAs were being considered as like a bottleneck uh, because it was we were taking about a day to kind of get an artifact into production after testing it, which was not uh, really good enough. Um, we had like some performance uh, problems. Uh, we, we were not having the right scripts to run the performance uh, tests, and also, uh, you know, we were not gathering the right metrics uh, in terms of performance. Uh, we had like feature toggles, uh, you know, compared to feature uh, branching. We were using feature, feature toggles, which were, which was working good for us. But the problem with that was we were not removing the old toggles, which mean which meant that. Uh, there was like a lot of dead code in the code base, and also a lot of redundant tests, which was in turn increasing the build times a lot. Uh, so as, as QAs, we came up with uh, a lot of um, ideas. And most of these ideas uh, were out of the QA retrospectives that we were having. Um, so I'll, I'll take you through some of them. Uh, so we as QAs like, you know, would love to pair with the developers in writing the automation tests. So for, uh, I mean, my idea of what a tester should be doing is uh, he should be saying what needs to be tested and how it needs to be tested or the implementation bit would be decided by the developers. Um, so we kind of automate as much as possible. And this is absolutely needed if we have to do 
continuous delivery. I'm, sh I'm, I'm, I'm sure that there's like a lot of, uh, uh, some people find this as an anti-pattern, but then we tried to write our automat automation tests uh, so that they're like, you know, in, in a very stable and maintainable manner. Uh, we have been also pairing with the business analysts in terms of, uh, you know, finding out uh, requirements and uh, doing gap analysis right at the beginning of uh, the software development lifecycle. We, we were also pairing with the DevOps people uh, in, in coming up in, in, in like, you know, having more build agents in, in the continuous integration uh, in, in the CI tool, uh, and also reducing the number of uh, tests from a higher level, uh, which means like system or functional tests down to uh, unit and integration tests. And we were also trying to uh, make those tests independent so that we could run them parallelly in, in, uh, in all the build agents. Uh, so the other problem we had was around regression tests and smoke tests. So the, the, the test suite was increasing. The manual test suite was increasing quite a lot. So we had to constantly refine and filter it so that we have a minimal amount of tests, uh, which would, you know, so, so that we could like, you know, test that in the given time frame. Um, and the, the, the other one I wanted to talk about is the QA environment. So we also had, uh, we also have multiple QA environments so that the, the, the testers can test parallelly and not wait for a particular build to go onto a QA environment whilst other, other testers are testing on the environment. So all these ideas uh, that we implemented uh, directly or indirectly kind of helped us in delivering the software to production uh, efficiently and keeping the quality in picture. So uh, this was like the, the, the crux or the principle of um, the, all the ideas behind. And I think as uh, uh, Lisa and Janet were talk talking about in their presentation, it's, it's more about collaboration and communication that we need to keep in mind. So we were, the, the key, as QAs, we were collaborating and communi communicating with all the other roles in the team uh, in various ways. And um, we were trying to kind of impart our kind of QA knowledge um, to, to various other roles and making sure that um, all the other uh, people in the team kind of think about quality at every stage in the process and not right at the end of the process. So that, that's the reason um, I would say that we should you know, focus more on continuous quality delivery rather than continuous delivery and not think about uh, continuous delivery as uh, a way of uh, delivering software uh, faster and quicker on production, but make sure that you know, we have quality uh, being considered at every stage of the software development lifecycle. Um, we have like a few um, challenges uh, that we still need to focus on, and uh, we are like trying to work on it. And yeah, that's about it. Any questions for Shinkas? Or oh, you all fell asleep. No, 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 it was that clear. Okay, then Andreas is uh, next. I want to talk about uh, scaling. So I scale this one first. Ah. So uh, in order to get this talk done in just 10 minutes, um, I hate to scale it up a little. So um, I will give you two talks in 10 minutes, which makes a total of 20 minutes for you. That's why we have two timers right here. Um, so where do I have to press? All right. Um, I start with a couple of principles, and these are very ancient principles in our terms. Uh, they are from back from 86, from the new new product development game by Nonaka and Takeyoshi. And um, yeah, when we uh, started Scrum back in 2004, um, we didn't know this article, so we didn't know anything about the principles. 
But we work in our uh, typical silos and we try to do our own thing and we try to change it by using Scrum and Azure processes. And um, well, so first of all, the first thing that we did was uh, we selected the right tool. So we needed a big tool. Uh, we used version one, nothing against version one is a great tool. And we told everybody to use this tool. And the second step was that we trained a couple of people in Scrum, um, especially the team leads, so that um, we had some Scrum experts. Um, we figured out that we should start in a SCADE environment, so we had an external vendor from Berlin. Uh, we worked back in Karlsruhe, and what we did was, uh, yeah, we kind of integrated them, so they were supposed to work on the back end of our system, and we were supposed on the front end. So, um, in that way, um, we started to mix around, mess around with the teams. Um, for instance, we had kind of uh, Scrum of Scrum meetings uh, by the Scrum Masters, where the Scrum Masters managed the process. And um, we had kind of uh, pre-planned backlogs and stuff. Um, for instance, one of the weirdest things that we had was uh, that the commitment of the team for a given sprint was decided by the Scrum Master. So, and at the sprint review, if the team didn't meet the commitment, the Scrum Master would say, but you committed to it. We said, no, we estimated that we would take about twice the time, and you committed to it. Um, so, <laughs> that was one of, the, um, one of our big issues back then, um, but we continued to fail with other things, um, and I'd like to share some more with you. So, by the way, if you read this question, this is the second line of uh, the talk. Okay, so, um, if you really want to mess up an agile scale implementation, uh, you have to ensure that each team is delivering their own component anywhere and that it goes um, uh, that there's no integration whatsoever. So it doesn't come together. And uh, we had those people from Berlin deliver their back end and we had our people in council deliver our front end. And because they didn't deliver the functionality we needed in the front end, we had to implement some mock-ups and stuff, um, which was kind of funny. So um, I think it took us about a couple of months until we had our first integrated um, delivery, which didn't work. But that was Scrum. So, yeah, Scrum is agile, so all the teams work agile on different things. Uh, some didn't work on software at all, they just worked on questions. They should prove, uh, well, we had a kind of um, series of spikes that should prove certain theories by our system architects. So, um, in order to get this running, um, we figured out that the first thing we had to do was um, uh, to establish a strong organizational hierarchy. Um, so we had a software factory that consisted of a couple of scrum teams that we mixed regularly, depending on the needs of the product backlog. Um, and uh, well, the first thing we eliminated was retrospectives, because retrospectives are kind of a waste of time. They take so much time. And um, yeah. And on the other hand, if we did retrospectives, it could turn out that uh, we found out some things about our management that weren't right, and the management didn't want to hear that anyway. Ah. All right, so um, that was a good approach uh, in order to um, yeah, obfuscate our development. And um, yeah, so we were a little more flexible about our time boxes. We had different time boxes in the back end and front end so that we could ensure that there was absolutely no point of time where we could integrate the whole stuff. Um, and uh, well, at the last um, three months um, ahead of the release, uh, our time became very short so that we skipped time boxes at all. Um, our software team in Karlsruhe was replaced by a bunch of white Russians. Um, they promised to work 24-7, that was their time box. And they delivered occasionally executable code and we were supposed to test it. Um, that was very good. Um, on the other hand, the first time we met, us, met with our CEO and presented him something that could re represent a prototype of the real product, uh, that was about six months in the project. Um, so after we messed, all of, messed up all of that uh, in our scaled implementation with about four, five, six teams, um, well, we've, we found out that we needed to protect our CEO from the truth. So, um, in order to do that, um, our management, the CTO and um, our project managers uh, gave us the directive that we should not report any more bugs before the release because uh, otherwise uh, the CEO could get to the impression that we're not going to make it. 
So, okay. Um, um, and in order to reduce transparency and in order to um, make our life more difficult, um, we had this special unit called system architects. And the system architects were responsible for creating the backlogs for the team. Uh, and the backlogs didn't have to do anything about the product. They contained some risk or technical spikes or um, other stuff that we were supposed to yeah, bring into the equation. So, um, well, our progress was virtually nothing. So it was good that we had no progress reporting because we had no progress at all. Um, yeah, it came up to, uh, we had different levels. So there were several teams still struggling with the big scrum planning software. Um, and other teams did pretty well. So we had the uh, manager of one unit um, will create the entire sprint backlogs for the next 10 sprints uh, with all task assignments for the developers. Um, uh, well, the, the first presentation to the actual product owner went wrong. And uh, I got depromoted from Scrum Master to some kind of a software developer build and integration, which was a very interesting experience, but nevertheless um, didn't work out that well. So, where do I have to press? Yeah, to, to bring the threads together, if you want to do an enterprise level scaling, um, you have to start with something. Um, there was something that Geiko Atzik uh, brought, brought up um, last year very well. And um, you can't repeat it often enough, if I can. Huh? It's the last line? Oh, here, here we go. So that was um, adopt the principles, adapt the practices. So start talking about the principles that are behind what you're going to do. And um, don't forget that all those tools and all those processes are there to make you implement those principles. And um, well, we lost the principles and values behind agility somewhere early on the way. And um, afterwards, we were doomed to fail. So if you don't want to repeat this failure, um, just don't do what we did before. Um, if you want to hear some more stories about uh, the failures that we had, um, including uh, very drunken sprint planning sessions and other stuff, um, yeah, you can talk to me later. Uh, I'll be there tonight, so if you want to have a beer with me, you can join me. And um, yeah, well, that's as much as I could put into 10 minutes about enterprise agility scaling, which I or originally planned to run as a, a full-day workshop, um, nevertheless. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Do we have time for questions? Yeah. Okay. Maybe we should get the things, uh, see if it actually works, because we haven't tested it yet, uh, if it actually works. I just hope it happens within our iteration as well, that we finish before the deadline. Okay. Thank you very much for your talk. I just have a question. Who are those white Russians you mentioned? <laughs> Who are the white Russians? <laughs> because I'm from Belarus. <laughs> well, it could have been anybody. So um, that was just a connection that some weird business people had back then from Karlsruhe to Belarus. And um, they just picked a bunch of guys. So there was a quite a shady firm, uh, firm in Belarus, yeah. But um, it's no special nationality. You can pick... No, I don't want to insult anybody else. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you, 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 can pick, you can pick other people's, yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? No? Thank you, Andreas. And then we go on to Andreas. Hi. Um, okay. Yeah, thanks for being here. I am talking about domain-specific languages. Uh, some few words about me. Um, it's relatively easy to remember my name because I couldn't afford a last name. I just have two first names. I'm Andrea Simon. I don't know whether this joke works out in English. Um, and <laughs> um, 
Okay, the only thing I can tell you for sure about my work is that I'm self-employed when it comes to what I do. I'm somewhat in identity crisis, especially at uh, conferences like these, because uh, uh, when you ask a programmer, I'm the tester guy because I do test-driven development and uh, acceptance test-driven development. When you ask a real tester, I'm just a programmer because I write too much uh, programming um, code, too much uh, production code. Okay. Um, this talk actually, uh, actually um, came from uh, last year, here, 2011 Agile testing days. I visited lots, lots of uh, very interesting talks and um, I'm a little biased because um, I have a diploma degree in uh, information systems in Germany and we are very focused on modeling and we love modeling, we love graphical notations, boxes, errors and connection. And um, some, it occurred to me that uh, the thread below, uh, lots of the talks, was about modeling. Some talked about explicit modeling. Um, for example, mind maps are a way for me to um, model, uh, model graphically and explicitly. And others were about implicit models uh, that build up in our minds and that uh, form our conversations that form our opinions. And um, so this was very important to me. And on the other hand, I was uh, exposed to the ideas of uh, domain language and domain-driven design during the last year, uh, especially, oh, okay, I have to use both. Yeah, uh, especially in my local software craftsmanship community. And um, the main point in domain-driven design is capturing the business language. Uh, we want to capture the language of the problem domain, the rules, the words they use, uh, for example, by building up a project glossary. And uh, we want to capture it in programming production code as good as possible. And uh, we as testers capture it in uh, automated acceptance tests, which is very valuable. We capture it in executable examples. But still, there's a translation phase from these examples and from the language to programming languages. And there is still some kind of gap between the programmers and the customers. And I think everything that uh, can help uh, to reduce this gap is very valuable. And what came up uh, in 2011-2 was the new book by Martin Fowler. Um, and he wrote about domain-specific languages, which is some kind of uh, the other side of uh, model-driven development. And, okay, this came all together, and so I proposed this talk. For Martin Fowler, uh, domain-specific languages is a computer programming language, language meaning uh, that you can directly execute it, and this is your production code. It's... Uh, very reduced um, in the meaning that you can't write uh, hello world in a domain specific language generally. Uh, you can, it's tailored specifically on a very small problem. Uh, and it's domain focused, uh, perhaps uh, even focused on just uh, a small amount of your problem domain. Um, I want to give you some examples of what's possible in generating domain-specific languages, and um, it's quite simple. My example, um, let's suppose we have a shop, and uh, we have some orders that we have to process, and um, so this order goes through various states. Um, when, when we receive an order, it's uh, new, and then one of two things can happen. Either we process uh, the, the order, uh, so we get into process state, or the customer can decide to cancel the order. And uh, when we process it, we send out the, um, the article that was ordered, and uh, we send out the invoice, and at some point in time, uh, this is paid. So what we as programmers come up with is some kind of nice graphical UML model, and um, it's relatively easy to solve this problem. We have an order that is connected to a state, and uh, there are transitions from a source state to the target state, which are triggered by events, by business events. And when we try to implement one instance of uh, this model, um, we have something like this, which is called a command query API. 
uh, we create some instances of classes and um, I don't know well okay we create some instances and um, we call some methods and uh, this is very common to uh, programmers but it's hard to read for customers but um, luckily we can do better especially if we use something like ruby which is very suitable for building an internal dsl this is valid ruby code um, but I think it's much more readable and much more, much more comprehensible for business users. And um, it's a relatively low-hanging fruit. It's easy to generate such things, to program such things. Um, and it's a nice, a, a nice training for your programmers. And uh, you can uh, communicate uh, better when you use such a language, but you are uh, bound to the a grammar of your host language. If you do not want to be bound, you can go for external DSLs. Um, I built one example with Antler, and uh, then you are absolutely free in uh, what your language looks like, and uh, you can reduce the syntactic noise around it. There are no keywords anymore, um, you're totally free, which makes it even more readable, but uh, on the other hand, you have to uh, invest in learning the tools and uh, it's a little more investment to build up your language. And um, the last stage I want to present is uh, this one. It's uh, built with a so-called language workbench and these, uh, these allow besides um, textual representations also graphical notations and uh, besides that uh, I'm not a great artist this looks uh, very much like the first example I showed you um, how my example goes and I think this is uh, relatively easy to communicate to your customer and you can uh, generate executable code from this um, this is exactly the same Ruby code that I showed you on the first slide but uh, it's directly generated from this graphical model. Okay, these are some books that uh, inspired me for the talk, and uh, thank you very much. If you're interested in the examples, uh, at least the textual, uh, textual ones are on my GitHub account, and uh, I'll be around till Thursday morning. Thank you very much. Any questions for Andreas? Yes. Uh, maybe I repeat the question. You, um, it depends on the language you say, but uh, what about the workflow of creating the language? Oh, I'm not so proficient in .NET, I'm sorry. Uh, so you, you, the thing about uh, integrating with some infrastructure? Yeah? So the graphical representation looks exactly the same and you can put any code behind. So it's a question. Oh, okay, I don't know the tool, so uh, yeah, maybe okay. you can... Uh, Achieve the same goals. Why not? Yeah. Okay. You well, you can study to your needs, but. Um, uh, I didn't employ um, especially the graphical one because uh, it's a commercial tool. I just used the evaluation license to build this model. Um, I think, well, okay. Um, when I proposed the talk, I hoped to get into a project <laughs> that allowed me to do it. Um, so actually, I'm most proficient with internal DSLs, which are mostly for programmers. But still, yeah it's easier to, to build and uh, build up new models.
Yeah, time's up. So, thank you, Andreas. Okay, and now the stage is for Anahit. Thank you. Okay, so my name is Anna Heat, and I will talk about automated testing integrated into CI tool and automated test generation. Why I wanted to talk about it is because uh, now agile software development methodology is widely used in many companies. And as our company already works with this for years, I wanted to share our experience and how we adopted testing strategy to this. So let's recap in our memories what Agile software development means. It's a group of software development methods that are based on iterative and incremental development. They promote time-boxed iterative approach and uh, encourage rapid and flexible response to change. So three of 12 Agile principles say, first one is customer satisfaction by rapid delivery of useful software. And working software is delivered in weeks rather than months. In our experience, we had even the days. And welcoming changing requirements in the latest stage of development. To analyze this and sum up, it means that we should be able to deliver a product which is shippable and has a high quality. And next, we should be able to inspect and adapt to changing requirements. To sum up, we should uh, uh, decrease amount, uh, time and efforts required for regression testing and be able to keep the quality of it. In our company, we have used the following approach. First one is uh, we have automated unit integration, functional and performance testing, and we have integrated into it into continuous integration tool. Second one is usage of automated test scenario and script generation tool that is a further improvement. As an example, we uh, use as a continuous integration tool in our company Jenkins, and Jenkins used for following purposes. First one is build management. We have separate jobs that uh, download the sources, run unit tests on them, and create artifacts which can be deployed on specific environment. We use it for deployment automation. We have separate jobs that uh, use those created artifacts and download them from, in our case, Nexus repository and deploy on specific environment. We use it for test automation. We have uh, jobs that run our regression suite and we have separate job that runs our Gmeter performance test. We have uh, also release management job that uh, reruns hold the test to make sure that everything still works for the moment of building. It uh, recreates the var files, tags them, creates automatic release email, which contains all the links to tagged artifacts, and sends it to operation department. This is a, a screenshot of jobs that we have, list of them. Uh, this is a screenshot of build jobs, you can see. Those ones, those jobs are deployment jobs. And here we have pre-release job that ex exactly uh, does what I told before. And here is a screenshot of successfully passed functional tests. Uh, there are three of them. Actually, because we have big regression suite and it cost us around one and a half an hour to do full, full, full automated regression, that's why we have split it up into several jobs that run simultaneously. And with this, we have reduced from one and a half an hour to half an hour whole testing duration. Here how it works. All jobs can be launched parallelly from CI tool. They run on same test environment, but from different slave machines. And what uh, results we get? That's a tremendously reduced time required for manual regression testing. It's a shortened feedback loop by getting ability to find bugs earlier during the sprint and get them fixed as soon as possible. We have eliminated human factor by having testing done automatically and not missing any cases. We have allowed continuous control over the quality of product. 
and as a further improvement, we can see reducing time required for developing test cases and automated test scripts, as it's for the moment the most time consuming part. And this can be done by integration with automated test generation tool, which is part of my research work, which is devoted to development of imitational model for web-based applications. It's based on methodology that has been used for um, synthesizing automa automated synthesizing functional control tests for microprocessors. And here how it works. The only thing that is required from a user, uh, QA engineer for example, is to input functionalities that describe the product. Then this list of functionalities is being split into equivalence classes. In each equivalence classes, functionalities are sorted by relation count. Relation count can be under, uh, understood as probability of specific functionality execution. And after that, the functionalities with the highest relation count are being taken from these lists. Based on a general list of such functionalities, adjacency matrix is being created. Adjacency matrix can be described as a, a describes relation between functionalities. Uh, in more detail, it says whether one functionality can be as a precondition for execution another functionality. Uh, based on adjacency matrix, sorry, based on adjacency matrix, we generate test scenarios, and when we already have generated test scenarios, we generate test scripts based on them. Here is a screenshot of adjacency matrix, how it looks like. It's an example matrix created based on several functionalities taken from Facebook uh, how, and how it works. Here you can see one. It means that, for example, you can enter your photo section if you have registered, if you are logged in on your home page, and if you are now at home page, you still can open your photo section. But if you are on guest home page or in your profile or uh, you have logged out, then you cannot do that. That's why there is zero. Uh, as a conclusion, while using Jenkins, we get the following improvement. We have min minimized time and efforts required for manual regression testing. We have a shortened time requ uh, uh, required for that and ensured continuous control over the product quality. With a, a further uh, integration with automated test generation tool, we will shorten time required for test scenario generation and automated test development. Also, we will eliminate human factor by giving possibility to generate test scenarios automatically. Thank you. That's Any questions? for test generation. Yeah. Is this research is done through any university? So is this a company research or this is uh, uh, an academic? It's my thesis. Yeah, my thesis work. Uh, where, where which, which university? Uh, it's a state engineering university of Armenia. Are you really uh, generating test cases or you just select some of the existing ones, depending on this matrix? Uh, depending on this matrix, actually, test scenarios are, uh, real test scenarios are being generated. For example, if we go back here, yeah, what we will get, we will first, at first step, um, it will take a registration as its initial functionality for everything. You should first, for example, be registered. Uh, there is one. It uh, takes guest home page. Uh, guest home page is a precondition for registration. So you should first open guest home page. First functionality in your scenario will be opening guest home page. Second, it will be registration. Then it will take the column of registration and uh, go to the next one. Uh, for example, after registration, you will be able to open photos, and then uh, you will have scenario which will consist of functionalities like guest home page, registration, and photos. A photos mean, a here means like opening photo section in your Facebook profile. Yep, yep. When it generates test scripts, it what it does, it takes from database already um, unit test uh, script 
created for specific functionality and then merges them to get the big full script for whole scenario. Time for one short question. What kind of input do you give to this uh, automatic test generation system? Is it just this matrix or? No, uh, this matrix is being generated automatically. For tool, you give uh, your functionalities. You describe them. They consist of precondition, postcondition. Precondition has state, like guest home page or something, and has input data if it's required for execution of specific functionality. Post condition has different state or the same state, it doesn't matter, it has state and has an action, what is being done during that functionality execution. When you describe the functionality by providing all the required properties, you input it to the system and you have a list of all those functionality based on their relation, like for example, um, if the post condition of registration is member homepage, and from member homepage you can enter photo section, then it means that those functionalities can be executed one after another. And it becomes a scenario. Thank you very much. You definitely know uh, what you're talking about. <laughs> you can explain a lot. So, uh, thank you. Okay. Then I'm looking for Stefan. May I put that to full screen? No, sorry. no I can't. Okay. Yeah. Does it, can you hear me? Good. Um, that's not me. Oh, that's me. Okay. Yeah. Good. Great. You probably noticed that there are no unicorns on the slides. And the reason is we had to deliver them prior to the conference. And here's the audio equivalence. Unicorn, right? So with that figured out, um, thank you very much. Whoever clapped your hands, great, excellent. Um, you can barely read that. Um, I love testing and I love the ocean. So my website is seasidetesting.com. Um, I come back to that at the end of the presentation. I talk about the surprising use of an interface. Um, earlier this year, I tweeted this and thought about, you know, I think the automation is actually more valuable than having the automation, the thing itself. Because when, in that project I was in back then, we found more defects and more, you know, valuable information for the project, project lead um, while creating the automation rather than having it run in, running it later. So, um, hang on. Anyway, let's, let's talk about the automation part not, and, and focus on that. Um, but also let's talk about craftsmanship. Um, we happen to use Cucumber and step definitions, but we also wanted to, I wanted the, the, the automation thing to stay rather clean and easy to understand and easy to maintain because, hey, I knew I would be on this project until the end of the year, and as it happened, I, I'm not on the project anymore. So what we did, we added um, on, the, on, a, on an abstraction level below the step definitions a module, actually a class, implementing um, the interface. And of course, on the, on the abstraction level below that, we have method definitions, we have methods calling other me uh, methods, and so on and so forth. So, um, in creating that, we followed Uncle Bob Martin's advice of extract till you drop. Because, you know, your method should do one thing, it should do it well, it should do it only. So, we, I just tried that. And I got the idea from episode three, functions of the cleancoders.com video. So if you are programming testers, I highly recommend that. It's funny, entertaining, um, and I learned a lot from that, I hope. So in order to keep the test automation clean, we started with a feature file. We coded everything directly in the step definitions and then cleaned it up. We extracted methods in order to have 
methods that actually do something with the application and other methods that assert certain things, check input, whatever. And then we moved stuff out of the step definitions into their own file, into their own module, and we refactored and repeated that. And then one thing occurred to us, given this, the top level method, the set of top level methods, we could create some sort of command line tool in order to, you know, try things out through the GUI or a web service or what have you. Anything could do it. And I would like to, to um, introduce you now to, to Pry with this. Is everybody familiar with the Ruby tool IRB? Essentially, it's, it's like it's a command line interface to the language of Ruby. Uh, but we actually use Pry. If you like IRB, try Pry. You're going to love it. It does lots more stuff than, than IRB does. Um, one example is it can show you the method definition if you know the method name. And it even does it for you if this method happens to be in, you know, it can show you the C source code of array reverse or something. It's, it's really it's so cool. So, the trivial example here is, you know, web search using Google, and the only method I'm focusing on here is search for something, and you enter the search term, and the thing, the method does everything for you. And what you get, when you add this super simplistic interface with Pry, you've got three lines of code, and you get your, you know, console application to talk, to that application through Pry. And I think that's totally cool. It's two, two things, just, you know, throw it together, works, it's excellent, it's fun. It's totally cool to use. So you, you fire that small application up, three lines of code. Um, it tells you that this is the context that you're current in. Your current object that you're sending methods to is a Google search object. You send it, you send it this search term, and it returns, well, a list of, list of hits, as you would see them uh, in the link text on the result side of Google. And this price screencast on Vimeo is really recommended. It's, it's great stuff. So, was it fast? No. Um, as I said before, you can expect, inspect methods. So if you said, say, hey, Pry, show me the method for a uh, uh, search for, it says, all right, I found it in this particular file on that line. Oh, by the way, it's six lines of code. Uh, the class is that, it's public, and here's the source code. I find that so useful, it's super great. But there's more thing. Um, you, can, you can actually start exploratory testing, or um, initialize your exploratory testing, because well, you can, you can call stuff, and it's stored in the history, and you can replay that, which means you can put your system into a certain state, and then explore from there. And then you can do it again within seconds, not 20 minutes setup time to create user and give them certain rights and whatnot. You just do that with a snap of your finger, and then you're there. I think this, this combination of a clear interface and prize are really it's a, it's a cool tool for exploration, actually. And I think, I thought about calling this automated assisted exploratory testing. Um, and I, I think I'm going to do this all the time in the next project. This help us find a lot, a lot of issues. And um, it's also a good tool to talk to um, programmers, I mean, you know, developer, you know, production code writers because they understand what you're doing. Um, the example code is already on Git. You find it there. And that's, that's a lie. It's not the slides which are going to be on my website. It's a blog post. And that should be published as soon as I get Wi-Fi access. Thank you very much.
There I must have questions. Be, yeah, there must be some questions. Most. Most of them, the technical uh, uh, sessions have some questions, but was that clear? If there are no questions, I'm here until Friday morning. Find me, talk to me. Uh, I'm there, I'm available. Oh, there's, there, one. there's one. Uh, we have the time. Are there any non-Ruby tools um, to do the same thing? <laughs> Just curious. Sorry, I don't know any. I mean, for me, this is you know pretty close to as good as it gets. If there's, this, I don't know, I don't. I mean, I, I like Ruby a lot, but if you give me, whatever, a C sharp tool that does it for me, fine. If I'm not allowed to use Ruby in a project, and you have a tool, I don't know, if you have a Prolog tool, for your project, it's okay for me. But I don't know them. Sorry. Does anyone else know? Yeah. Reflector, I hear. Okay. Okay. Since this is 10 minutes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. We we'll keep it Thank short. you very much. He's here. Thank you, Stefan. I'm available. And we're, uh, again, we're spot on time. Um, and there's uh, uh, Uwe is next. Or isn't he here? He should have been. Okay, he's coming. Okay. Okay, I thought I'm number eight, but no problem. Can I have the buzzer? Which button? Fine. So um, I'm working at Jamalto and we have a vision I want to share with you. It's just that we make digital interaction secure and oh, I've not pressed the button, but it works alone. <laughs> ah, <laughs> I do nothing. Okay, but you see, another world market leader. <laughs> We make uh, 2,000 million revenue in 2011. We are 10,000 employees. We are working worldwide and uh, very successful. That's me. Um, I have 20 years experience in quality management, software validation, business excellence. I just show this to uh, show that I'm dealing with quality at all, not only software validation, but also business improvement, quality excellence, and processes. And here I uh, shortly describe our environment. It's just to see that we do uh, software for mobile devices, PC, web browsers, whatever, and have a central server. Who does it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fine, thanks. Uh, this is some kind of a blueprint just to show, okay, we have software the end customer sees and we have software the end customer does not see and that we uh, do a lot of testing uh, for the stuff the end customer sees because here we have the problems, here is the diversity we have to fight with and here we get the complaints of the end customer. He does not care how we save the data in the Oracle database or not but he sees when the button is in red instead of green, whatever and then you start the discussion and you have the changes on the left side and more often than on the right side. So can you? So, and we have started analysis just to see, okay, 
what steps do we have and uh, where is the effort? So we make it very simple. We say, okay, every time we run a test, we have some kind of pre-processing, we have the test itself, and we have some kind of post-processing. It's very easy, it's always the same. So since I'm an engineer, I like tables, so we start with a little table. We have different perspectives to show at these three steps. First is effort. We measured all our manual tests and see, okay, executing the test, it's only 20% of the whole effort. Next. We have the risk. The risk with issues is very high during the test case. We have the motivation. The tester likes to play with the solution we have, but he does not like to make the prerequisites and to clean up the system after running the test. We have the complexity. We have the visibility to the customer. Next. We have the diversification. You have seen that we make software for mobile devices, for several browsers, and things, thanks to Google Chrome and Firefox, we have very often very new releases of the environments we have to deal with. And we have to handle this somehow. And it's very hard to automate here, because normally the system itself is faster than the automating environment. Okay, next point. Test expertise. I want to run the tester here. He should not do always the monkey stuff. He's my expert. He knows how to use the application. He knows what is usability. He knows what the end customer wants. And maybe the monkey task can be done by others or by tools. Um, next. Okay. Next. Uh, just click five times or something like that. Uh, I just want to say, okay, there are limitations of automation. We all know this, and I don't want to read that all, but we all know automation is not perfect. Next. Next. <laughs> so, the conclusion is, how can I get the best of both, of the manual and of the automation of testing, having the table in mind? Okay, next. So, especially at the beginning, do automate the pre-processing and the post-processing. Next to save most of your effort. Because you have seen 80% of your effort is pre-processing and post-processing. So next. And fight the weakness of the automation itself. As you have seen, we have many um, different systems we have to test. We have short time frames with the new browsers and all that. And maybe it's better to automate the stable stuff and to use your manual tester for the changing stuff and to know the application I test. Because always running automated test frames, maybe there's a point that you say all tests are 100%, but you have never seen the application. Okay, next. So, but I do not say do not automate. I just say, okay, when all this runs, you every time need these prerequisites and these post requisites. And when this is stable, you have done the work you ever have to do every time anyway. And then when you see, okay, all the discussion with the customer is finished, the background environment is stable, you know the prerequisites of your tests, and you know how to clean up the system, then start with automating the user interface, because you know yet now I have an environment, it's stable, and it's worth to work on it. Okay? So, and can you all reuse all the stuff for regression test, performance test, security test, it's always the same. You need your prerequisites and you need to clean up the system anyway. Okay, solution. Next, please. We maintain test data in a shared cloud used by developers and testers. Everybody can give test data in the system. Everybody can use this test data. There are little tools like make my prerequisites, inject contact data 1 to 100, and then I will start my test. Next. Add tools to this cloud. Data injector, clean up, compare tool. For example, we sync contact data from mobile devices. You have uh, 26 data sets for each contact. To compare this by hand is a monkey job. But to say, okay, inject it, sync it, and then use the compare function of this tool and get the results. Okay, next. Yes, when you have all this, then write your test cases, having all this stuff in mind. For example, the test case can be, okay, inject data set 1 to 50. It's a prerequisite of my test. 
then change manually data set 50 to 51. Then compare data set 50 of your database with data set 51 in the address book. Okay, next. So integrate this test data manager in your frameworks. We, for example, use Robert Framework for user interface testing to have a keyword-driven approach. We have a quality center for maintaining the test data, uh, the test cases. We use JMeter for uh, performance tests, and we use self-written scripts on the devices to inject data in the address books, for example. Because you see, uh, you often get new environments on your mobile devices, and it's very hard to get an automated framework running on all these devices. But to have simple scripts are able to inject data in the local address book of the device is more easy. Okay, next. That's it. <laughs> okay, any questions for Uwe? I have one, because um, I, I was triggered that you said that past processing takes about 50% of the, uh, of the test effort and post processing like 30%, so automation is only 20% of the effort, the test execution. And uh, I think that's something, w I'm not going to say that don't automate, because automate creates a lot of feedback, but when you automate your test, it's, you're only making 20% of your test effort more efficient. And it's just suboptimal when you automate. Uh, the execution. No. We do automate all execution, yeah. Yeah. but uh, this analysis was just of the manual tests we had, and we yeah. measured with uh, 20 testers how long did they take for all these steps, and then we make statistics and say, okay, it looks like this, and then we said, okay, we first automate pre-processing and post-processing, and when all this is stable, after that we start automating the user interface test with Robert Freeman. Okay. More questions? None? Okay. okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Uwe. G give uh, Uwe a hand. Thank you. So these were all the consensus talks for today. Tomorrow there's another session. Uh, please fill in the evaluation uh, in your evaluation booklet. And if you haven't done for each session, which is, uh, uh, that, that doesn't have to, but maybe you, should, uh, you can fill in the consensus talk as a general. Uh, but just a quick uh, feedback loop. Who likes the setup of consensus talks and think we should do this more often? I think so too. So that's, that's nearly 80% uh, of, of, of you. So uh, thank you very much, and I uh, hope to see you around. <laughs>